Good morning. It's Saturday morning and I just broke my... <laughs> oh, that's not good. I broke my pointer. Oh, well. I'll use it as it is. Now it's a back scratcher. Listen. If Satan can screw something up that God meant to be so simple and beautiful, he would. Now, you... If Satan can get people to misinterpret the scripture, misapply the scripture, he will to screw something that God gave us that is so easy to understand, yet confusing when Satan gets in the mix of it. I'm talking about two ordinances. I'm talking about the Lord's Supper and baptism. I already talked about the Lord's Supper, so I'm just going to review it real quickly so you understand it, and I'm going to flip the board, and I'm going to talk about the real purpose of baptism. Okay, you don't want to miss this, and in fact, this is something you probably want to share with other people, and uh, so please do that. Okay, first of all, the Lord's Supper, what it is and what it is not. There's different views of it. And I've already uh, explained that last time. There's three different views. Uh, actually, four. The first, the top three is what's called the Catholic, the Lutheran, and the Reform. All three of those views believe that in partaking of the Lord's Supper, you are incurring powers or saving grace. Okay? In other words, something mystical is taking place. In the Catholic view of transubstantiation, they believe that the elements, the wafer and the grape juice or wine or whatever it is, it actually changes literally into the flesh and blood of Christ. So if you partake of that, you're partaking of the flesh and blood. And that is repeated every time you go to communion. Okay? And then there's consubstantiation, which says no, the elements themselves don't change, but the mystical presence of Christ is around it. It's a kind of a coexistence with it. And then you have the reform. There's no real physical presence, but there's a spiritual. So, and then there's the memorial view. The view is, hey, do this in memory of me. Now, I'll explain this again at the end, and I'll make it really simple, okay? And we'll talk about baptism. First of all, you, you need to understand that salvation is by grace alone. Okay? The Bible makes that really clear numerous places that we are saved by faith, by grace, that not of ourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. So it's not a matter of works. It's a matter of putting our trust in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what repentance means. It means to change of mind from what you were believing in, which may have been baptism, to just the simple death and resurrection of Christ as our substitutional atonement. Simple. Salvation is simple. Baptism now. Oh, that's a whole other thing. Baptism. <laughs> Baptism comes from the Greek word baptizo, which means to immerse. You know, you put something in water, it immerses. It's done also synonymously meaning to identify by immersion. To identify to something, okay? Now, in the New Testament, we see a number of different kinds of baptism. There's John's baptism, Christ's baptism, when uh, Christ was baptized, believer's baptism, the Holy Spirit baptism, and the baptism of the cross, okay? They're different. The kind I'm going to talk to do about today is believer's baptism. But let me first identify these so that you understand. John's baptism uh, was a forerunner of Christ, and he came to baptize the people of Israel for repentance 
to confess your sins and repent for the coming Messiah. Because a change was about to take place. Christ was baptized. He didn't have any sin, so he didn't need to repent. Okay? He was being baptized by John for only one reason, and that's to identify himself with the people so that all righteousness, as it says in Matthew, would take place. He is going to be the right one that's going to pay the penalty for all these people that John was having baptized for repentance and for turning to the coming gospel. Okay? Believer's baptism is found in Matthew 28. And in believer's baptism, this is what we're going to talk about a little bit here in a second. Baptism by the Holy Spirit takes place when you are born again. In Ephesians 1, it says we are sealed, sealed, like a stamp of approval, sealed for eternal life. It came upon believers for the first time permanently in Acts chapter 2. That's when God established the body of Christ. Then there's the baptism of the cross. That's when in Romans 6, you come to understand that the minute you put your trust in Christ, you are transferred from the domain of darkness into light, and you legally were on the cross with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. I have been crucified with Christ. That's talking about your legal standing, not your practical earthly standing. Obviously, you weren't there 2,000 years ago, but you were there in the sense that God imputed that death to you, and you were there in Christ. Okay, <clears throat> so what's the mode of baptism? Well, the mode... You can see if you if you understand cross cultural uh, whether they're uh, passages whether they're temporal or permanent. Uh, some is just talking about the practice. Some is talking about the principles. Some is talking about boat. Some is talking about the practice, full practice, partial, or no practice at all, just a principle. In this case, baptism. What's the mode of baptism? Well, we have three different. One is immersion. That's total immersion. The other one is partial, you know, going in the shower, or there's not a lot of water, the other is sprinkling. Okay, the one that best identifies the death, burial, and resurrection is immersion. What is the actual mode? The Bible doesn't specify. We, we do see is that there's a lot of water where this took place. They didn't have churches with baptismals and all that back then, so they were in the rivers or pools and so forth, you know. So that's the way they baptized. I, I think it best symbolizes what baptism is. When you go down in the water, that's your old life. When you come up, this is your new life, the death, burial, and resurrection. You don't have water. You're in a war zone. You put your trust in Christ. And you, and, and, and you want to be baptized, <laughs> they want to pour a canteen of water, you fine, do it. Okay, I think God is pleased with that. <laughs> okay, he's more pleased with their heart attitude than the mode. Okay, the time, when should you do it? It's soon after with baptism. If you understand what baptism is, it means to identify with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. In other words, I was this way, now, I want everybody to know, as a testimony, that I'm now a believer, I'm a Christian, I've been born again. It's a public testimony. It's an initiation, okay? And let me, let me kind of illustrate that to you. When I was in the Army, I uh, was sent to jump school in Fort Benning, Georgia. And there was over 300 of us. And only 125 of us made it through uh, back in those days. This was in 1970. And uh, you had all the armed forces there, Army, Marines, Navy, Air Force, all together without distinguishing what armed forces they went. Or no rank was displayed. You only had a number. And so they would calculate your progress to jump school based on a number. And out of the 300, 125 of us made it through. At the end of the last day, we had what's called a, 
we had to jump out of plane. This is our fifth jump. And we jumped into a field, and then we're going to have a ceremony. Okay? And on that day, they gave me, and the one, and all of us that finished that jump, what's called blood wings. I'll never forget it. It's a little wing like this that they put into your chest. I still got two little holes here. You know, and they call blood wings. I am now initiated as a member and a full pledged paratrooper that nobody can ever take away from me. Okay? It was a proud moment at my age, but what was it? It was initiation. It's no different like if you go into a fraternity or you even go into a gang and they initiate you, you're now saying, I belong to this group. This is what sets me apart. That was what baptism is, to identify with. I'm now a part of Christianity. Okay, let me tell you what it is not. It is not for salvation. I know the Church of Christ teaches that, and others do too. Oh, well, you got to be uh, repent and be baptized to be saved. That's not what that passage meant. I wish these people would learn how to do hermeneutics, or basic Bible study. Okay? Uh, it cannot be because then it would contradict all the other plain, simple passages. What did Jesus tell Nicodemus to get to heaven? You got to be baptized? No. He says you got to be born again. Okay? Being born again means putting your, your trust repenting from what you were trusting in into the final uh, finished work of Christ on the cross. That's it. Okay? Baptism is simply telling everybody that that's what you did. And now I'm a part of this, this group called Christianity. Okay? Some places that's very dangerous to do. It could cost your life. In a lot of places it causes your family and friends to reject you. You know, but that's what God wants us to do. It's an obedient act following salvation to demonstrate who you belong to now and what you're going to support and what you're going to live for. Okay, another thing it is not. It is not meant, unfortunately, like a lot of people believe, and I was taught, to remove original sin like the Catholic Church teaches it. There, it, there's no such thing. When you're born, you're born you're, with a sin nature. It's not going to be taken away until you die. Now, your sin nature is going to be exchanged for a new nature. Okay? But you're still going to have both, an old nature and a new nature. But babies, even after I was seeing this priest, he was baptizing this, this baby. It was funny. And the baby suddenly had to urinate. It's a male boy, okay? And he urinated all over the priest. <laughs> I saw this other priest. The baby was crying. And the priest slapped the baby right there over the little basin. And the parents were shocked. Such a stupid ritual to subject children to. You see, because baptism is done by people who have an understanding of what it is. And babies aren't making that choice. If anything, that's for the parents' benefit. Now, if you want, you can do infant dedication. There's nothing wrong with that, saying I'm going to dedicate. But that's not the same thing as the public testimony of baptism to demonstrate that you now made a willful choice to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Whole different thing. So it's not for salvation. It does not move, remove any original sin. The only person that can remove all your sins is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he did that at the cross. And the minute you put your trust in him, all your sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven. They're covered with the blood of Christ. Okay. So let me ask real simple again. Baptism, here you are in the world. You put your trust in Christ. You understand what baptism is. You now want to identify as a Christian in the universal body of Christ. This is your testimony. And you now want to let everybody know that you identify as a Christian by your baptism. And that's simply all it is. The Lord's Supper 
simple. How often do you do it? As often as you want to remember the Lord. You know, and be thankful for what he did for you. It's, I mean, the two ordinances of the church are simple. The Lord's Supper is simply to remember. Remember is the key word, what the Lord did for you with a grateful heart, a thankful heart. And the Bible says, as often as you come together, do this. Not in a certain place. It doesn't have to be in a particular order. It is not a love feast like they were practicing in Corinthians where people were always abusing it. It wasn't a full supper. It wasn't anything like that. It was simply thanking God for what he did for you. That's all that is. And baptism, all it is, it's an initiation rite, letting people know that you're now a part of this body of Christ called Christianity. Simple. Don't let the devil take what God made plain and simple and confuse it and turn it into a religious ritual. That's totally, in fact, why you do that. I think a lot of people who do it probably not even save. Okay, they don't understand the true spiritual implication and meaning of what those two ordinances really are. Hey, listen, I got to go. Share this with some people, okay? And uh, help them to understand that most of the things in the Bible are really simple. God bless you all. Bye.